The history we learned in school focused on the big events that shaped our world. But oftentimes, it's the small stories about people or places you may never have heard of that are the most interesting parts of history. That's why on tonight's edition of The Best Times, we tell you more stories of the history you do not know. Funding for The Best Times is provided by the Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. Many of you watching this show will remember eating at the Gridiron Restaurant or shopping at Shaneberg's. But do you know the stories behind those Memphis landmarks? And if you lived in Memphis in the summer of 1949, do you remember an American Airlines plane crash near Cherokee Golf Course? Or does the name Lil Harden Armstrong ring a bell? These are just a few of the stories that make up the history of Memphis. Wayne Dowdy, archivist of the Memphis Public Library, is here to tell you more about the history you do not know. Wayne, thank you for being on The Best Times again. Thank you for asking. Tell us me. more about the history that we don't know. You bet. <laughs> and you've got some great stories yes. for us. Yes. You know, Memphis, like the rest of the country, uh, Memphis is a city of immigrants. And you've That's got right. a story about the Italian immigrant That's population right. that formed a, a Catholic church here in a very pivotal year in the history of the city, correct? Yes, indeed. Um, Italian immigrants began arriving in large numbers in Memphis after the Civil War, and Memphis already had an established Catholic community, mostly um, uh, Irish Catholics who were um, who worshipped at St. Peter's, St. Patrick's um, uh, downtown, and uh, so they began attending and. Uh, and of course, they could understand the Latin Mass, mm -hmm, but yeah. when church announcements were made, or if there was ever a sermon or whatever that was said in English, they couldn't understand it. And so the Catholic Church sent in 1870 uh, Father Anthony Lacelli to Memphis, who was originally from Genoa, and uh, to uh, minister to the Italians at uh, at St. Patrick's, and. Um, then um, as the immigrant, as the Italian community grew, then there was a decision that they really needed their own parish. So in uh, March of 1878, they laid the foundation for a new church called St. Joseph's. And uh, a couple of months later, Memphis suffered its worst yellow fever epidemic. 5,000 Memphians died. Uh, and uh, even though St. Joseph's wasn't completed yet, it, very, it became very much a symbol to, uh, to Memphis of civic renewal because it remained and uh, the, uh, the parish was very active in nursing to the sick during the uh, yellow fever epidemic, including Father Lucelli, who uh, probably worked harder than anybody else, just constantly on the go, uh, ministering to people as well as uh, taking care of the sick and the dying. And at one point, um, his parishioners begged him, uh, please go north, get out of Memphis while you can. And he refused. He said, I have work to do here. But finally, he'd had enough of them harping on, you've got to go north. So he boarded a wagon, said goodbye to everybody, and went and started driving in a northward direction. And about six blocks later, he turned around and said, I've gone north far enough, 
and he went right back to work. And uh, Father Lucelli survived the epidemic. That's what's amazing, is yes. that he stayed here and survived. That's right, that's right. And uh, his compassion, uh, as well as the fact that the, the parish continued to build the church, and it opened, and um, uh, despite the, uh, you know, destruction of the yellow fever epidemic, um, uh, Memphis survived and St. Joseph's survived. And St. Joseph's uh, remains an active church. It's out in Whitehaven now. And uh, it still has an immigrant. They do. In fact, they have a very strong immigrant outreach popula uh, uh, program, which is very much in keeping with their history. Um, and, um, uh, and again, it, it, it shows not only uh, the compassion of Memphians and the desire to help others. But it also shows that uh, we very much historically have been an immigrant town and been welcoming to immigrants of, of varieties of from wherever they are from. You know, I think I know a little bit about Memphis music history, mm -hmm. but you have a story of someone that I have actually never heard of. Uh, Lil Hardin Armstrong, native Memphian, That's right. uh, who's famous for a number of things. Uh, Lil grew up uh, not far from Beale Street. Her mother and her grandmother were very active in the church. She learned to play piano in the church. She performed every Sunday, uh, but she didn't live very far from Beale Street. And uh, when she was a child, W.C. Handy was in Memphis composing and performing. And so she was constantly being pulled to Beale Street to listen to that music, which did not make her mother very happy. <laughs> and uh, she went, when she graduated from high school, she went to Fisk and studied music. Uh, but then her mother decided that uh, Memphis music was too rough. And she um, uh, said, we're leaving Memphis. And they go to Chicago, which is probably the worst place for her to go if she wants to avoid popular music. Because at that time, uh, there is an explosion of jazz music. Uh, a lot of performers from New Orleans are coming up where jazz was, was essentially created in New Orleans and then spread up the Mississippi River and then moved up to, uh, to Chicago. And she went to work for a, um, uh, for a music store. And at this point, this is just before recordings really began to become available. So music stores sold sheet music and they had to have people there who could perform the music so that people could hear whether they wanted to buy the sheet music or not. So Lil's job was to sit at a piano and play different music. And one day a man walks in and he hears her play, he's impressed, he talks to her, and he says, let me show you a few things. And he sits down and he starts to play the kind of music or similar to the music that she used to hear in Memphis. And uh, the man's name was Jelly Roll Morton. And Jelly Roll Morton is uh, a seminal figure in the history of American jazz. Uh, he is one of the two or three most important figures in the early days of jazz. And, um, it's through Jelly Roll Morton that Lil gets her first uh, performance gig with uh, a band led by Joe King Oliver, who was really uh, probably the, the most important Chicago jazz band at this time in the late teens, uh, early 20s. And uh, while she performs, plays the piano for King Oliver's band, uh, she meets a shy little trumpeter that is playing for King Oliver named Louis Armstrong. And uh, they become friends and then fall in love and get married. And Louis is very happy working for King Oliver. He feels a lot of loyalty to King Oliver. But it's Lil who says, you're good enough to go out on your own. So Lil and Louis form a band called the Hot Fives. And uh, soon after, they record a series of, of records um, uh, for the Victor Recording Company, which are some of the most important uh, jazz recordings that have ever been made. And Lil not only played piano, but she also composed music. Uh, she composed a, a song called Strutting with Some Barbecue. <laughs> and she takes what, what, is so, what is so important about Lil uh, is that she takes Memphis blues, New Orleans slash Chicago jazz, mixes it up, 
and does what Memphis musicians have always done, which is take disparate uh, influences mm -hmm. and, and created something new. And um, uh, she, not only did she, did they, did she compose and they recorded Strutton with some barbecue, which clearly has a Memphis connection, but uh, they also recorded with Jimmy Rogers, who was then known as the father of country music. And uh, Louie and Lil were hired by uh, the Victor Recording Company to accompany uh, Jimmy Rogers on a new song. And the song is about Memphis and uh, standing on the corner of Beale and Main and is, is some of the lyrics. And so uh, Lil contributes all of that to Jimmy Rogers' work. And so again, the bridge between what is considered country music and what's considered jazz is, uh, is melded together in this recording. And uh, it's a very important recording. And uh, Lil and Louie continue to perform. The Hot Fives eventually become the Hot Sevens. And, uh, but by the end of the 1930s, the two had grown apart and they divorced. Louis Armstrong, of course, goes on to become uh, the, the great, yes. right. Yes. But Lil also is very active. She forms an all-female swing band, an orchestra, the Lil Hardin uh, Orchestra, and they perform all over the country and record songs and, and are very, very popular. And uh, she continues to perform through the 1940s, through the 1950s. She retires in the 1960s and um, an interesting sort of postscript to her, to her life. Um, when Louis Armstrong died in the early 1970s, she was asked to perform at a memorial concert for Louis. And uh, in the middle of performing W.C. Handy's St. Louis Blues, she collapses and dies of a heart attack right there on stage. Uh, playing W.C. Handy's music in tribute to Louis Armstrong. So we see, you know, the, the bridge between Memphis music, uh, New Orleans jazz, uh, all encapsulated in that one moment. What an amazing uh, yet tragic ending yes. to that story. Um, I am old enough to remember Shane Berg's mm -hmm. department store. Um, now, it used to be, it was, started out as black and white, correct? That's right. I don't remember black and white, right. but I do remember Shanebergs. And you've got a story about uh, the start, how Shanebergs got started. Well, the Shaneberg family are Russian immigrants who come again, this theme of, of immigration and immigrants uh, coming and building uh, much of this town. And uh, the Shanebergs came, and uh, Mr. Shaneberg uh, opened his first store, uh, essentially a dry goods store. And uh, he hired a man to paint his store uh, downtown. And, um, so, and he left to go on a shopping trip over in Arkansas to buy goods to sell in his store. So when he returns, he finds that the man painted the store black and white, <laughs> white with black trim. So he decided, well, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good sign. So he calls them the, uh, the black and white stores. It's not a department store, but it's not a five and 10 cent store either. It's sort of in the middle where they, they, uh, they're not just small goods uh, and inexpensive goods. They do have some clothes and that sort of thing. They're very, very popular, and he moves into uh, the neighborhoods. He moves into the Park and Highland area. There's a, uh, if you drive down High Park now, uh, on the uh, right, as you're turning onto Highland, there is a uh, sort of a little strip mall mm -hmm. right there. That's where the black and white store was. And, um, uh, and there were others in uh, the eastern area, one of the first, not the first, but one of the first to uh, move out of downtown. But at the same time, um, the, um, uh, the family began to think in terms of, of uh, moving beyond the black and white uh, discount department store and creating their own department store. The black and white store downtown uh, was in the late 40s was um, uh, converted into more of a department store. Uh, within their store, they had uh, a restaurant that catered 
to African Americans, a restaurant that catered to whites, which was very different. Goldsmiths and Lowenstein's did not have that. They had a whites only um, um, uh, restaurants. So, uh, and they also had two uh, hairdresser shops, one for, one for whites and one for blacks, which, which is, I mean, we look back on that and see that as very, very unfortunate. But uh, at the time, that was actually fairly progressive that they were specifically reaching out to the African-American community for their trade, which most businesses did not. Um, when uh, the founder of the, um, uh, the department store, the, the, the black and white stores died, in his honor, they renamed them Shaneburgs. And so the name Shaneburg becomes uh, uh, right up there with Gerber's and uh, Lowenstein's and uh, some and, of the other lost departments. And that's stores. right, exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah. And Shane Burr's, of course, eventually eventually closes, like all the de downtown department stores. And uh, but it is uh, not only is it fondly remembered, but it, it also again uh, shows us uh, the diverse community that existed in Memphis. You have another story about, uh, a scary story yes. actually, about an, an airplane crash, right. a commercial airliner. It That's took place right. right here in Memphis. That's right, there was a, a, there was a, a regularly scheduled flight that uh, left the airport. And, and it's interesting, there was, a, there was a, a businessman who had boarded the flight and he was sitting in his seat and they took off. And he said, he thought to himself, something's not right about, you know, he just didn't feel right. He traveled a lot. He said, but I wasn't worried. And, uh, uh, but all of a sudden, they start to lose altitude. Something's the, not right. Yeah, something is definitely <laughs> not right. And uh, at this point, they, they have left the airport. They are over uh, Getwell Road. And um, uh, Getwell at that point was uh, semi-rural. Now this was, was what year? This was is this? 1948. Okay. And so um, there are a few stores, uh, but there's still a lot of farmland and open land. And it's not very far from uh, the Kennedy Hospital, which at that point is still a, uh, an army hospital. It'll eventually become a veterans hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the pilot is trying to gain control to find a place to land. And the stewardess, who doesn't know what is going on, uh, looks out the window, instead of seeing blue sky, she sees trees. And the next thing she knows, bam, they are on the ground. And they land near, just past uh, Willow Road and Getwell, which uh, I'm sure most viewers have passed by that area mm -hmm. at, at some point and uh, it was densely populated now. And, uh, but there was a field just past Willow. And fortunately, the uh, skill of the pilot and the co-pilot, they were able to land um, and um, uh, with uh, no damage to anybody else. And, you know, people did what they always do, uh, People who are in the surrounding area, there's a man who owned a Weona store right there on Willow at Getwell, ran to the, to the wreckage. Uh, the stewardess was uh, one, one of the passengers, said he, she was the bravest person he had ever seen. She was pulling people out um, and uh, with no regard to her own safety. And at the same time, others are climbing down through the bottom of the fuselage and getting out. Others are getting out through windows that are being broken by citizens who have run to help. And miraculously, no one dies. I mean, everyone survives because of the skill of the pilot and the co-pilot, the bravery of the stewardess, and the citizens who came to help. And the other thing is, if the, if the pilot had not been able to land there, he would have plowed right into Kennedy Hospital. Exactly, exactly. And we can't even imagine well, there the toll be, that yes, would have hundreds. taken. Yes, yes. indeed, yeah. indeed. Amazing story. Yes. Um, another place that I remember, <laughs> uh, I'm old enough to remember, is uh, Gridiron Restaurants. That's right. There were several around the city, mm -hmm. open 24-7. You mm -hmm. could always, you know, in the middle right. of the morning, you could go there <laughs> right. and get yourself something. Uh, but they were, they were founded by... Um, very important restaurateur in the history of the city. Indeed, uh, Harris uh, Schooner 
was from New York, from Brooklyn. He was a security salesman. He sold bonds and, and so on. And um, in the 1930s, one day, you know, something snapped with him. He was selling these things and, you know, he was on the sort of the dodgy end of, of securities and bond sales uh, and felt very, felt very guilty about what he was doing. I'm not sure, he didn't do anything illegal uh, by any means, that was, that was how things worked. But he increasingly felt that uh, he was doing wrong and so one day he just said, you know what, I've had enough. And he just left his office, left his apartment behind and uh, started hitchhiking and ended up outside of Memphis. And a man picked him up and uh, he said, where are you going? And he says, well, I really don't know. And he says, well, come on, I'll take you into town. And he drops him off and uh, he gives him 25 cents because he has no money, although he is wearing a suit <laughs> because that's what <laughs> he, he was hitchhiking in a suit. <laughs> that's right. Okay. That's right. And uh, which is probably one of the reasons why he was picked up. No, it's like, what is so. this guy's story? Yeah. You know, and so he takes that 25 cents and he goes into a place. He buys a bowl of chili and uh, gets a glass of water and then he uses the rest of the money. He actually was taken on the outskirts of Memphis and he used the rest of the money to pay a taxi cab to take him to downtown. And so he began sort of survey the scene and he thought about that meal he had, which wasn't terribly good. And uh, he became, he got to, he, he got a job uh, working at a dry goods store, but then he became interested in restaurants. And uh, he opened a small restaurant, and um, from that small restaurant, he developed a, a, a chain of local restaurants called the Gridiron. And the Gridiron was important not only for what you were saying, but also for how they maintained quality standards. He bought a warehouse uh, on Dudley, not very far from off Lamar, not very far from Elmwood. And uh, in this warehouse, they built a kitchen, they built uh, storage facilities. And so every day, uh, a lot of the food that was served at uh, the gridiron was partially prepared and then shipped out every day. So that when, so it wasn't like they were taking out a frozen hamburger mm -hmm. and slapping it on, it was actually meals that had been partially prepared so that it was easier for to prepare them. They were fresher. And, uh, and so this became um, one of the most important restaurant chains in Memphis. But Schooner was also someone, remember this is someone who had been haunted by the fact that uh, he felt he was cheating people. And so he wanted to um, uh, build restaurants for African Americans to use. This is still during the day, era of segregation. So, uh, and he builds a series, uh, he takes the gridiron system and reproduces it for a series of restaurants called the Harlem House, which are exactly the same yeah. as the gridirons, uh, but they tailored to the African American community. Um, he also uh, built the first drive-in restaurant for African Americans, the Gay Hawk Drive-In. And the Gay Hawk was, and still is, it's still around, is uh, a very important place. Not only did it, was it a, a fine, a, a good place to eat, uh, providing service to African Americans who didn't have it. So the Gay Hawk really filled that need and there are so many African Americans who look back at that time in the 50s and the 60s when the Gay Hawk was sort of at its peak uh, as uh, a great sense of pride in that place. And it was this guy from New York, a white guy, but unfortunately, Schooner uh, met a tragic end. Um, he, w he began to feel, feel ill. He didn't know what was wrong with him and he started to forget things. He started to just feel, he had, his ears were hurting and, and one day he just sat in his office on Dudley and pulled out a gun and shot himself, oh. which, is, which is horrible because this man had done so much for this community and, uh, and he's been totally forgotten and, and uh, he, he does not deserve to be forgotten. Uh, his story is a fantastic story and important to, um, to Memphis restaurant history because the gridiron sets the stage for uh, the steak and egg 
kitchens, CKs, all mm -hmm. of these places that that uh, you know for for so many years now have served um, uh, the eating public and. Um, and, and just the fact that he was someone who could bridge that divide at a time when nobody was bridging that divide. What an amazing story, tragic ending. Yes, yes. Well, Wayne, I've enjoyed these stories. Thank you for coming on to Best You're Times Again welcome. and telling us more about the, the history we don't know. You're very welcome, thank you for having me. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.